Hello and welcome to Lecture 5 as we continue our study of 1 Thessalonians. This lecture will focus on uh, chapter 2 beginning at verse 13 and going into chapter 3 ending with verse 5. I'll break this up into three small little sections and, and take a look at uh, each section uh, one at a time. First section is uh, verses 13 through 16. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. I want to focus on the idea of being thankful. Thankfulness is uh, an important theme throughout this letter. I think it's something that uh, we can overlook in our faith walk in God. Uh, being thankful for the things God does. Here specifically, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they're thanking God uh, because of what God was able to accomplish in rising, raising up a, a new Christian people at Thessalonica, and that God was actively working in the world uh, specifically through them. How powerful thankfulness can be, the very mindset, uh, how it can keep us from being discouraged in the world. Uh, in one of my early lectures, uh, maybe even the first one if I remember right, I talked about the four strands of prayer as Luther would read the Bible. And one of those, of course, is being thankful. And just think about how Luther approached God's word. Every single part, every single verse in God's word gives us something to be thankful about. Going on is the doctrine of the word, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. I'm not going to dwell a lot on this. Of course, the word of God is a means of grace. It's the way the Holy Spirit creates faith in the life of somebody. Think of Romans chapter 10. Uh, an interesting thing here is we kind of have a twofold thing going on. One is that the Thessalonians were receiving the message of Paul who was preaching the gospel personally to them. And they received that preaching, that, that audible word of God. Uh, they received it faithfully. And of course, that's what created faith in them. In this letter of 1 Thessalonians, it is the written word of God that they will accept and they will receive uh, as the living word of God. Uh, the word is such an important thing. Without the word of God, without the Bible, there would be no faith in this world. We would have no knowledge of God or any faith in him. So this First Thessalonians is picking up on a, a very important theme. I want to share two other scripture passages with you. Think of Isaiah 55. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth, and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So that's God speaking, obviously, through Isaiah, the power of the word of God. Hebrews 4. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. 
it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So when you think of the Word of God, always think of something that is living. That's how the Holy Spirit works in your heart, in your mind, and in your soul. I'm going to go on to another theme here in this section. So obviously we've been talking a lot about suffering and persecution. I just want to point out something here about how Paul identifies the Jews as those who are causing suffering. So let's be clear here. Uh, Paul says, you suffered from your own people. So this is the pagan people in Thessalonica that he's talking about. They suffered the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus. So in verse 14 here, Paul is not really talking about the Jews in Thessalonica, but he's saying there's a similar dynamic. Remember those Christians in Thessalonica being called out of a pagan culture are going to be persecuted by their culture for being different in the same way that the church that started in Jerusalem suffered from the Jews who obviously killed the Lord Jesus. But I want to just be very clear on something. Who exactly are the Jews? We, this can be understood in two different ways. So option A is the Jews, all of whom, who killed the Lord Jesus. Uh, that would be blaming every Jew in every place in the world. So in other words, uh, that is just placing the um, blame for the death of Jesus upon every single Jew. Well, that's not right. I mean, not every Jew was guilty. Uh, there were certainly faithful Jews. Think of Joseph of Arimathea. Think about um, the apostles. Yes, they stumbled, they fell, but, but these were people that were, almost all of them were, were, were Jewish. Uh, and so the better way to think about this is not every single Jew is ultimately responsible, but simply the Jews, and then parenthetically, not all of them, but only those who killed the Lord Jesus. So not something we have to dwell a lot upon, but uh, just to, to be clear in there. So option B is the correct one. Option A is not correct. But going on, again, this theme of suffering is going to be there. Not only uh, was it there in the early church as Jesus died on the cross, not only was it there during the second missionary journey, but it's in your life. It's in my life. It's going to be in the life of the church every single day until Jesus comes back. Remember the words of Jesus. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. It's not something we love to think about. But suffering and persecution is never foreign to the Christian life. I would encourage you, I don't have it on the screen, um, but just take a look at Psalm 2 and see what you find there about the world persecuting the church. All right, let's go on to the next uh, section, verses 17 through 20. But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. So on a focus here, Satan blocked their way. He blocked the way uh, from them going back to the city of Thessalonica 
to see how they're doing and to encourage them. Exactly how did Satan block their way, we really don't know. It could be that uh, just through the ongoing persecution, the ongoing um, civil strife, as people were opposing Paul, that practically uh, Satan created a barrier for them going back. We also remember that uh, Paul talked about his thorn in the flesh, some kind of a physical ailment. Uh, and so maybe he was suffering some kind of a physical thing which prevented him uh, from physically going back. We really don't know. I want to go on to the next thought here. They talk about, for what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Interesting things here. In what way could these new Christians be the joy, the glory of Paul, Silas, and Timothy. We do receive a reward, don't we, for the work that we do. A couple of times in Scripture, uh, we have these interesting sayings. In Revelation, we have the words of Jesus, Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. The book of Daniel, towards the end, it says, Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. A simple thought here is that as we live out our life of faith, as God does wonderful things through us, when he comes back, God is so good and so gracious that he will reward us for wonderful things he did through us. Of course, we were there along the way. God is actually using people like Paul. He's using people like you and me to share the gospel and to do things. So one general idea here is simply that when Paul, Silas, and Timothy are in heaven, one of the great joys they'll have in heaven was knowing that uh, those Thessalonians are in heaven, obviously ultimately to God's credit, but because God used Paul, Silas, and Timothy to bring the gospel to them. So we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in class. The last section here is chapter 3, 1 through 6. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who was our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted, and it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. But Timothy has now just come uh, to us from you and has brought the good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we long to see you. I did go that extra verse 6 there. We'll pick that up uh, next time. Uh, I originally, I said we're going to go through verse 5, but that's okay. So I want to just have you kind of keep things straight in your mind of, of what exactly is unfolding here. Uh, where is Timothy and, and how is he uh, in Athens? And he, he goes to the Thessalonian church and then he comes back and Paul's able to talk about it in the letter. It's actually fairly, uh, fairly straightforward. So remember, the second missionary journey, it happens between the years 49 through 52 AD. We find it in the book of Acts, chapters 16 through 18. 
and just kind of unfolding of the events, Paul and Silas, they preached first at Philippi. They uh, were persecuted. They left Philippi. Then they preached at Thessalonica. And of course, there they were in the Sabbath, or they were in the synagogue for three Sabbaths and for some time with the Christians afterwards. Paul and Silas were forced from Thessalonica to go to Berea. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is how much was Timothy with them during all of this? He may have been there, but during some of these persecutions, especially at Philippi, we know that Timothy was a very young man at this time. And so maybe he would not have been imprisoned or had the things happen to him as happened to Paul and to Silas. But what we do know is that Paul and Silas, so they went from Thessalonica to Berea, and then from Berea, they go to Athens. And now while they're at Athens, at this point, Paul is going to send Timothy from Athens to Thessalonica. Timothy is going to bring a message there. He's going to see how things are going. Timothy is going to come back from Thessalonica and he is going to be again with Paul and Silas and uh, they are going to wind up in Corinth. And during the second missionary journey, they're going to be in Corinth for about 18 months. And it's actually from the city of Corinth that 1 Thessalonians is written. And that is why Timothy's journey back to Thessalonica and his return back is all right there in the letter of 1 Thessalonians. So I hope that just helps you keep things chronologically uh, clear in your mind. In this section, in verse 5, uh, I would just want to focus on, I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. So that's the reason why Paul sends Timothy back there, to make sure that that new church is simply okay. Uh, there is a danger, isn't there? Can somebody fall away from faith? Yes. They can. Uh, Jesus makes this clear in the parable of the sower. I uh, won't read the whole thing there. you got the verses in front of you, but Jesus talks about uh, those who uh, are persecuted. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. So some people can be in faith and then fall away. 1 Timothy 4 we're reminded that what? The Spirit clearly says that in latter times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Makes it clear that uh, if they abandon the faith, they were at one time in the faith, and by abandoning it, they have left it. So here too would be something more we can certainly talk uh, about uh, when we get together. So, to wrap it all up, questions for discussion. Why is thankfulness such an important aspect of our Christian faith? And what can we do to be thankful? Second one, what powers does Satan have in this world? And then here's an open discussion, and I'm leaving this kind of, uh, of a very open-ended uh, type thing. So react to the following idea. Christians should work hard in their faith, knowing the harder they work, the greater their reward in heaven. So give that some thought, and I look forward to us getting together. Thank you, and God be with you.